The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Jennifer Schaus coming to you live from Washington, D.C. on Monday, June 13th. Today, uh, we are continuing our U.S. federal government contracting webinar series, and our topic for this afternoon is contract administration and best practices. Our presenter is Joe Moore, and he has a wealth of information and knowledge about this topic, so we're very excited to have him here. Uh, we, this is our last week of the webinar series, so we'll conclude on Friday. Uh, the only day that we are not doing one this week is Thursday. For anyone that's in the D.C. metropolitan area, we are doing a lunch and learn that day at the Tyson's Corner offices of Insperity, and the topic there is teaming partnering, and subcontracting. Uh, there's a separate link to register for that lunch and learn. Uh, if you're interested, you can send me an email directly. My contact information will be on the last page. Uh, but we do have uh, other uh, exciting topics this week, including uh, facility clearances, unsolicited proposals, and SBIRs. Uh, so our agenda for today, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Joe Moore will introduce himself. We'll jump into his presentation. Joe will then make some concluding remarks, and we will take your questions in the order that they are received. Uh, if you do have questions, you can type them in on the lower right-hand side of your control panel, which should be on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, everybody is in uh, a mute mode, so um, should you have a question, we're not going to be able to hear it, so please go ahead and, and type that in. We do have a full hour, uh, but we probably won't take the, a lot of time unless we have that many questions. Um, so quick uh, blurb about myself, I've been in government contracting almost 20 years, started my career with Dun & Bradstreet, and we were selling uh, financial and credit information about businesses to the federal government, whether it was to GSA or to contracting officers that were getting to award contracts or to some of the intelligence agencies that were looking at money laundering, white collar criminals, and other activities. Uh, I launched my business about 10 years ago, and our services include anything from proposal writing, um, sales and business development certifications, contract administration, and we also host events at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., where we bring in about 200 to 250 government contractors, as well as government agencies, typically the OSDEBU, uh, which is the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization. So stay tuned for our upcoming events. Enough about me. Let's uh, hand the, uh, the controls over to Joe Moore, who we are lucky to have with us today, and he will tell you a little bit about himself and then about his firm and the services that they provide. Joe, thanks so much for being here today, and the floor is all yours. Thank you, Jennifer. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Joseph Moore. I'm the president of J.D. Moore & Associates, LLC, a company operating out of Williamsburg, Virginia. A few uh, additional remarks about my background. Um, more than 30 years of experience in the federal government contracting arena. I've been a contracting officer both for federal government and private industry. My last federal government assignment was with the National Archives at College Park, Maryland as a senior contract manager for a couple of their special programs. Uh, I'm a retired Navy supply officer with a background in acquisitions and logistics. And uh, the other specialty I had was uh, aviation logistics. I'm a part-time counselor with the Virginia Procurement Technical Assistance Program down in Hampton, which provides assistance to businesses in the area of federal gun government contracts. And I am a certified professional contract manager. My business is structured as a number of subject matter experts that we bring in when the opportunity is presented, presents itself. We do project program management, uh, proposal analysis support, compliance reviews, strategic sourcing and planning, indirect rate development, contract administration, and we also deal with all phases in a similar area with Virginia government contracts. Okay, on to the presentation. Let's talk about contract administration. Contract administration is one of those areas that I realize is not a priority for some businesses. We're going to explore ways why it is an important function 
for either the prime or the subcontractor. I am not intending on reading the slides to you, but there is a couple slides I want to put some additional emphasis on what is on the slide. The first slide we have here is the definition of contract administration, ensuring that both parties fulfill their contractual obligation. And then we have definitions from the FAR, the Federal Acquisition Regulation, of may, shall, and must. These are actual definitions from the Federal Acquisition Regulation. The numbers I have behind each of those definitions, the first group of numbers in the parentheses is the Federal Acquisition Regulation itself. The next group of numbers over on the far right is the number of times that that word appeared in the Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation Supplement. Next slide, please. OK. Contract performance. The government desires that the services and the goods be delivered in accordance with the terms and conditions of the contract. OK. Your company is affected not only by the way it's being evaluated on the delivery of those goods or services, but also about your understanding and day-to-day -day operation of the contract. And you have some idea, you have some ideas right in there in that next section that talk about what you could be evaluated on by the contracting officer. And then MBWA, management by walking around. This is critical for a company to be aware of what each of your employees are doing to support a sound contract administration effort. Next slide, please. This area is one that we could talk about at great length, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it just other than just restating what, what is here and giving you a couple additional examples. Um, these remarks that I make here are related to an unclassified contract. A lot of these items I'm talking about right now are coming out in current solicitations. They're not presented to you in any order of importance, but I want to give you a few of them. And most of these are training courses that the contractor or employees are required to have. Personal identification information, cybersecurity, communication security or call ComSec, accessing government computer systems, information assurance, and anti-terrorism training. Additionally, in this area, we're also looking at requirements for the contractor to be able to uh, provide basic background investigation requests and control and monitoring of common access cards, which are used within DOD to gain access within facilities and bases. Tomorrow at 12 o'clock is a uh, seminar on security clearances, and I uh, recommend you set in on that when you have the opportunity. OK, compliance. Compliance comes from a number of different categories. Terms and conditions of the contracts, regulation, executive orders, or FAR clauses. OK, items that, that are included in this section that, that may be indicated in the contract somewhere is uh, reporting of re replacement of key personnel. Um, reporting of employee security training being completed, weekly or monthly status reports, and any other number of issues that could be uh, listed in the contract. I have a question for you, and I just throw it out there. I'm not going to answer it, but what are your responsibilities to meet reporting requirements? Next slide, please. Funding. Funding is critical to the operation of your company. If you do not have the funding, you're going to have a hard time staying in business for a long time. Okay. We have a section here in most contract clauses right now, in, in the clauses incorporated either in full text or reference, that talk about 
the availability of funds or the limitations of funds. Funds are a big issue in government contracts. The contracts are incrementally funded, which means they're only providing a partial funding at the time of the award of the contract, and later on during that contract period of performance, they add additional funds. The clause that I'd like to make reference to here on, on limitation of funds is FAR 52.232-22. That's limitation of funding clauses, and that specifies how the percentage is, is arrived at for when you as a contractor have to notify the government that your funds are running low. Next slide, please. Invoices. This is just as critical as funding. The issue here on invoices is you have to know the proper submission procedures. You have to follow up if any invoice is rejected for non-approval and find out what that issue is and correct it. Because each time an invoice gets rejected, in most cases, your time that you're waiting to get payment starts over again. So this is one of the most critical areas of government contract administration. DOD uses a system called, called Wide Area Workflow. Other federal agencies use different systems and different uh, payment processes. So it's critical that if you're doing non-DOD work that you understand what that agency's requirement is for submission of an invoice. Next slide, please. External reporting. This is reports that you have to provide to other agencies. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I jumped jumped up jumped ahead here on you. I'm sorry. Uh, we're on fraud right now. Um, fraud is uh, the area that can and does happen. It can be prevented by using some of the recommendations listed here in this slide. If a company allows fraud to occur, it can destroy a successful business in a short order and prevent and eventually prevent you from being eligible to receive any government contracts because of the fact you are debarred. So please be cautious um, with respect to fraud, uh, keeping keeping your controls up and your eyes open. Okay, now external reporting. I'm sorry I got ahead of you here. External reporting is that reporting that you have to do to other agencies outside of the agency that has issued you the contract. A big case here that comes up very frequently on external reporting is an example of the VETS 100 report. This is a report to required to Department of Labor annually on companies that are employing veterans. The filing period is open from the 1st of August until the 30th of September. So the report has to be filed by 30 September. It's required for all federal contracts greater than $150,000 in value that have been entered into or commenced since the 1st of October of 2015. This is, this is a critical report. And recently, federal agencies have been making contact via your SAM registration to inquire why certain reports uh, related to the Service Contract Act have not been filed. So the government's getting to be a little bit more intense on their requesting for information and making sure that information is being provided. Next slide, please. Government property. This is something that may or may not be a requirement in your current contract. 
but it's placed here in this presentation just to make you aware that this requirement does exist. Government property uh, requires different types of reports to be filed uh, in the course of having that government property in a, in a contractor's possession, such as receipt of property, annual inventory of, uh, uh, of, the, of that government property, and transfer of custody when the, when the government property is transferred out to someone else. The takeaway here is if you have government property, the contractor is responsible for replacement costs for any government property that is not accounted for. Close out. This is often to open look, an overlooked event from the government side and the contractor side. If you have a completed contract, I suggest that if that contract's been closed, been completed for close, completed and closed for more than six months, that you notify the contracting officer and ask them when are they going to conduct a formal type of contract closeout. This contract closeout can can be with can can allow for the government to withhold monies from your final payment until this has actually taken place more so in cost type contracts than in firm fixed price contracts. The next slide. Contract modifications. I cannot say critical enough times. Contract modifications is where the government is modifying an existing contract, changing terms and conditions, adding clauses, uh, adding money, uh, modifying the statement of work. Anything that's in the contract could be modified by a modification to a contract. It is critical that you, as a contractor, review all the language that's being presented to you in a modification and check all the numbers, especially when it's related to contract funding. Government contracting officers can and do make mistakes. So just be aware of that. So in closing, first closing remark is the government does have a vested interest in your ability to form a contract because they've entered into this agreement with you to provide them a good or service. So they are vested in your ability to perform. Advantages of contract administration. You are compliant. You have a better idea as to what the next event is going to take place in the contract. Not a major surprise, such as someone contacting you via your SAM registration asking for information as to why you did not submit a report. You are also better prepared to submit a more precise response to any request for proposal because you have all your information readily available to you as to what you performed, how you performed it. So I would now like to take some questions if I could please. Sure, that was a great presentation and obviously there's a lot of uh, components to contract administration which you obviously know very well. So thanks for that. We do have a couple questions that are coming in. I'm just going to move to the uh, next slide that has Joe's contact information on it. Uh, and that way, if you do have questions, you can reach out to him directly. Uh, first question says, what if you do not perform any contract administration? What are the repercussions? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, you could be putting your contract that current contract and any future contracts at risk. Uh, it could, it, you know, con lack of contract administration could result in a, a termination for default. There is a textbook out called Administration of Government Contracts. It's 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 a uh, very thick book. It's the writers are is Sabinik and Nash who are professionals from George uh, Washington University in the area of contracts. And that book is full of case studies as to what happens to companies when they do not perform contract administration 
in different areas of government contracts. So it Great. is critical. Uh, that you sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. That's okay. Uh, did you finish with your answer there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, the next question says, is one element of contract administration more important than another? I would say that no one element is greater than in importance than the other, it, but it, it's going to depend on the type of contract you have. For example, if you have a cost type contract, Cost reporting is is paramount in that type of contract arrangement to back to the government, where it's not as uh, as visible in the area of a firm fixed price type contract. But um, no elements important more important. They're all they're all they're all in the contract for some reason. So they need to be viewed as as equal to each other, but Again, the, the type of contract you're working on is going to dictate the importance of what's going to, what's going to be the uh, higher of importance for contract administration. And the next question reads, who should be the contract administrator in our small business? Should we assign this to our accountant? Should we outsource it? What is, in your idea, the best practice? Well, for a small business firm, first of all, the owner needs to, nip, to know what is going on with the contracts. They may have a comptroller or they may have a bookkeeper. That function could be supported by that comptroller or the bookkeeper, but it needs to be performed jointly by the owner or the comptroller bookkeeper person. If the company is fortunate enough to have access to a contract professional, then that contract professional should be working with those other individuals to make sure that the contract the contractor is staying compliant on all issues re with regarding to reporting and, and um, administration of the contract. Okay. Another question says, can you give us an example of government property, which you mentioned in one of your slides? Okay, government property. Let's say, for an example, um, you're doing your company is doing some testing or, or maintenance on jet aircraft engines. Uh, you would get a possibly a, a computerized test console from the government that you would use to perform these tests. So, therefore, that that government property would be turned over to you to use in the performance of your contract. And that uh, test module or computer and test module com combination is owned by the government and is maintained by the government, but you have the custody of it to use it in, in existence with your contract. Um, big, com big contractors like General Dynamics, uh, Raytheon, Lockheed, they all have a, an individual group that their whole function is is tracking and maintaining and keeping records on government contract property. Um, but property is you know is, is turned over to the contractor to use for a specific contract. Right. Uh, will the government ever come on site for contract administration? I think they mean coming on site to the person's company. Um, I would say probably not, but if the government suspects things are going amiss, they could send out uh, the person from the government side of the house that's doing government contract administration from them. Government contract administration is either done by the contracting officer or it's sent out to an agency for the called Defense Contract Management Agency. Uh, and then that and that's usually specified in the contract is who's gonna who's gonna retain the contract for administration. Um, larger contract dollar values are usually turned over to Defense Contract Management Agency. Um, 
in that particular situation, you are more than likely to have someone from Defense Contra Contract Management Agency come to the contractor's facility. Um, I can't say periodically, but you know, at some point in time, just to see how things are going. Uh, most most contract, excuse me, most contract administration uh, retained by the contracting officer. It's the uh, contracting officer's technical representative, the core or the COTAR, contracting officer's officer representative, the core or the, or the COTAR, C-O-T-R, contracting officer technical representative, who is performing that administration function on behalf of the contracting officer. Great. I'm going to chime in on this one, too, um, because we primarily help companies with GSA schedules. Uh, GSA does periodically send out, um, well, they, they used to call it uh, CAV, C-A-V, Customer Assisted Visits, where they're checking uh, compliance, reporting, payments back to GSA and, and those uh, items. Uh, and then additionally, I learned uh, on one of the uh, facility clearance uh, webinars that we did last week, and uh, there's another one tomorrow that sometimes uh, in those scenarios, depending upon the type of uh, clearance that you have, uh, the government will send somebody out for a, a one day, I think they call that an audit or a, um, a verification or something along those lines. So I guess it also depends on the, the type of contract that you have. Uh, next question reads, I'm a subcontractor. Uh, do I need to pay attention to contract administration as well, or is this only the responsibility of the prime? I would say as a sub, you need to pay attention to it because there could be clauses that are flowed down to you in your subcontract agreement that put the requirements on you to uh, provide a certain level of uh, contract administration. For example, the one that the reporting requirement I gave you on the VETS 100, that is a mandatory flow down clause. It should mean, which means it has to come from the prime contractor to the subcontractor. So you need to be aware as to what your your clauses are telling you. And clauses in federal government contracts are put in in two different ways, full text or incorporated by reference. Full text, you get the full clause right there in, in the contract document, so you know exactly what, you, what you're required to do. If it's incorporated by reference, all it is is the reference number as to what the reference is from the FAR. For example, I gave you a, uh, a site for a limitations of funds, 52.232-22. That would be incorporated by reference from the information I gave you. But you don't know what's in that clause until you open up the FAR and find that clause and read it. Oh, uh, what is? It, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jennifer. And I was going to let you finish your thought. I'm sorry. Um, so, so those clauses, if they're uh, flow down to the subcontractors, they need to be aware of what's in their subcontract from the prime. Great. Uh, and the next it looks like it could be our last question here. Um, is what is the biggest mistake that companies make with regards to contract administration? The biggest mistake. Mm -hmm. I would have to say, based on my experience, is failing to provide, failing to do contract administration, just not doing it. Okay. Gotcha. So yeah, it sounds like it's. Uh, as far as the best practice if you're dealing with the government, either as a direct or as a sub teaming partner, uh, this is something that you should certainly be aware of and, and implement. Uh, every, there's another question asking for copies of the slides and the presentation. Um, this is being recorded, so we w will send out the link and as well as the slides uh, separately. So Joe, thanks again for being with us. It was very informative. and. Uh, thanks to everybody who dialed in today. If you have further questions, you can reach out to Joe directly or to, uh, to us. Um, I'm just going to move over to the next slide and give you a list of the 
uh, other topics that we've covered in case you're interested in listening to any of those uh, webinars or if you want to join us um, throughout this week as we wrap up uh, our government contracting webinar series. Joe, any last thoughts for the, uh, the audience? My last thought is just be diligent and know what's in your contract. That's the best thing you can do to protect your business and, and your rep business reputation. Great. Well, thanks again, and thanks, everybody, for joining us, and hope that we will uh, see you later on this week for more of our webinars. And we will now conclude the recording.